Hello, what are you doing here? Don't you have better things to do? Probably not. In which case, let us discuss free speech, freedom of expression, and freedom of the press. This amalgam of rights that allows us to communicate our internal convictions and beliefs to others. Now, that's not a cut and dried case. It's not slam dunk. You see, freedom of speech led us to communism, to Nazism, to fascism, to cults, and to travesties like third wave feminism. So, freedom of speech, in my view, should be curtailed, not enhanced and increased. Freedom of speech should not extend, for example, to lies, misinformation, incitement, hate speech. Everyone agrees with that. Should it be extended to Holocaust denial? There are clear cases, clear outliers that should not enjoy the protections of free speech. Almost everyone agrees to that. The problem is people fail to agree what constitutes a lie. What renders some speech hate speech? There's no disagreement about the principles, there's disagreement about how to apply the principle, the principles about the content, disagreement about the characteristics of the content. About a week ago, I granted an interview to News Intervention, which is an East Asian uh, news website. I've been working with them, and this is the 12th interview, I think, that I've granted them with the uh, inimitable Scott Douglas, Scott Douglas Jacobson is the interviewer. I started by saying that freedom of expression, including freedom of speech and freedom of the press, is a feature of individualistic societies. Where collectivism reigns, this amalgam of rights is subordinated to the greater good. People can't just say anything they want. They have to take into account the environment, their families, their loved ones, their neighborhood, their colleagues, society at large. In the Philippines, they call it kapwa. Ironically, the philosophical school of utilitarianism inexorably leads to limitations on these freedoms intended to protect the majority against the incursions of disruptive or even destructive minorities. Yet even in anarchic polities, even I would say in anomic polities, freedom of expression cannot be abused. Even, even, anarchy, even societies where there's anarchy and anomie, they don't allow freedom of expression which is intended to spread panic, like the famous example of crying fire in a crowded theater. They don't allow life-threatening misinformation, for example, about the COVID-19 pandemic and vaccines. They don't allow to threaten the livelihood, lives, and well-being of other people, for example, virulent racism or calls for eugenic culling or victimization. All these speech acts are strictly prohibited, even criminalized in many countries. You deny the Holocaust in Austria, you go to jail, asked David Irving. Only anomic civilizations in decadent decline countenance toxic speech acts. Jacobson asked me, which countries and parts of the world seem the freest regarding freedom of expression? And I told him that it's a surprisingly mixed bag including perennials like Denmark and Finland, but also surprises like Argentina and Slovakia. But freedom, all freedoms, are on the decline, on the decline everywhere, besieged by populism, profound mistrust of authority and expertise, anti-intellectualism, anti-elitism, anti-liberalism, anti-progressivism, and the dominance of a rapid dissemination of technologies such as social media. All these, this confluence threatens freedoms of all kinds. First and foremost, freedom of speech. Oclocracies, mob rule, are regaining ground all over the world, led by authoritarian, proudly ignorant, and defiantly contumacious and reactant narcissistic psychopathic leaders. That's the picture of global politics nowadays in many countries, from Brazil to the United States. Jacobson asks, 
in which nations and regions of the world seem the least free regarding freedom of expression. And again, it, I tell him the rankings are counterintuitive. Canada, for example, is less free than Uruguay and the USA is languishing with Peru somewhere at the bottom of the upper third. Jacobson, how did and does the internet change freedom of expression or the access to free exchange of words, ideas and philosophies? Or simply, is it simply disjointed, randomly emoted thoughts? Vaknin, ponderously and contemplatively and of course sagaciously. In the internet age, the distinction between raw information and knowledge, structured data, is lost. The internet is a huge dumping ground for half-baked truths, rank nonsense, misinformation, propaganda, hate speech, speculation, and outright derangement. Even where vetted and reliable information is available, it is unprocessed, out of context, or shunned actively by conspiracy theories and ignorant people. No single technology has harmed free expression and free speech more than the internet. It has created a problem of discoverability, locating quality content in a sempiternal tsunami of trash. How do you find good content in these mountains of trash? It allows, internet allows mobs to form and to ominously suppress speech by sheer force of numbers. For example, the cancel culture is the latest example of such transgression or transgressive behavior. And finally, on the internet, like-minded people coalesce and convene. Confirmation bias is amplified. People don't listen to alternative views. They inhabit thought silos and echo chambers. All semblance of civilized informed speech is now lost even in academe. Social media were deliberately constructed by engineers and turncoat psychologists to polarize aggressive speech and cement confirmation bias, silos of like-minded people in echo chambers, as I said. I'm going to post a series of links uh, in the description of the video. There will be a series of links which you can then surf to see other interviews and other conversations I had regarding the role of social media in all this. As social media are utilities. They should, should be subjected to the same regulatory oversights that other media and monopolistic utilities are under. Additionally, owing to the addictive nature of social media, laws should be passed to restrict their use and to monitor the content posted on them. Self-regulation is nonsense. It's a myth. Self-regulation was a myth in Wall Street, and it is a myth in the tech valleys around the globe, in technology, where money rears its head, where money is involved, morality and restraint and the public interest, they all go out the nearest window. Crowdsource regulation is the dumbest idea ever. Majorities are forever silent. Majorities are conflict averse because they want to maintain the status quo. Minorities are vociferous. Minorities are active. And so they dictate to the majorities. Ask the, the misnamed Mensheviks. They were, act, they were actually the overwhelming majority. Mensheviks in, in Russian means the minority, but they were actually the overwhelming majority and they yielded to the equally mislabeled Bolsheviks who were more ruthless and more vociferous and better mobilized. The Bolsheviks were the minority, but they were cruel. They were violent. So they suppressed the Mensheviks and they, they mislabeled their rivals. They called them the minority when they were actually the majority. Majority. That's what's happening on social media. The evidence is unequivocal. See studies by Twenge, for example. The more extensive the exposure to screens, the longer the screen time, the higher the prevalence and incidence of anxiety and depressive disorders, especially among the young under 25 and among seniors over 65. There is no such thing as mild or moderate use of the internet. The effects commence the first moment of use. Jacobson asks, 
What do trends of expression and outcomes among users of social media tell us about individual psychology and mass psychology and social media in general? Vaknin, the inevitable Vaknin. By far, the biggest problem social media use has fostered is what I call malignant egalitarianism. Malignant egalitarianism is threatening our existence as a species. Until about 10 years ago, people, even narcissists, had role models. They sought to learn from role models, to emulate the, emulate the ideas which they aspired to. So they were following thought leaders. Today, everyone and his dog, never mind how unintelligent, how ignorant, how unaccomplished, everyone claims superiority, or at least equality, to everyone else. Everyone is as much a medical doctor as any trained medical doctor. Everyone is as much a historian as any trained historian. And everyone is as much a psychologist as every professor of psychology. Armed with egalitarian equal access technology like social media and Wikipedia, everyone virulently detest and seek to destroy or reduce to their level their betters, experts, for example. They cannot, they want to ruin that which they cannot attain, that which they, they cannot equal. Pathological envy egged on by instruments of relative positioning, such as likes on social media. Pathological envy had fully substituted for learning and self-improvement. Experts, scholars, intellectuals are scorned, they're threatened. Everyone is an instant Renaissance, Renaissance man. Everyone is an instant polymath and a Zatz da Vinci. But this is just one of many vile side effects and byproducts of social media. So Jacobson almost sighs and says, how will the metaverse and associated developments in the 2030s affect relations between people? I'm saying, is the metaverse the ultimate dystopia, I'm asking him? Is it an escape from reality? Is it promised technological heaven? And I refer him to a, an interview I've recently made with Divya Thakur, and I'll post the link in the description. Jacobson. If the goal is mental health for most people most of the time, what are the most efficacious policies and laws for governments to enact and for individuals and families to practice regarding social media and the right to freedom of expression? The vaccine. Limit usage time. Clocks embedded in the app will terminate use after two hours. Two, only real life friends and acquaintances would be allowed to become online friends. Three, Identity verification would be mandatory for various types of content. Four, introduce an accreditation system for experts, gurus, and coaches online. Five, scholar tube instead of YouTube for vetted, evidence-based knowledge provided by real-life academics or experts. And six, curation of most content prior to its release. The contemporary, contemporary Wikipedia model is distinct from the original crowdsourcing model of Wikipedia. And again, there's a link about how to fix social media. Dazzled by my genius and brilliance, Scott Jacobson says, thank you, Dr. Shmuel from Shoshanim. And Vaknin responds, you're always welcome, Shoshanim. And so are you.